Greetings brothers and sisters. Hello and welcome back to Eva's House of Spirit. For those of you who are newer to this channel, I'm Eva. Welcome also to my backyard. You might see that some of the leaves are starting to turn. It's not like a spectacular display, but fall is upon us. Also, I'm wearing my jacket. It's a little bit nippy out here. Today's topic is going to be seasonal spirit work. There's a lot that can be said on this. I'm just going to try to summarize as best as I can the points that I feel are relevant to this topic. If you have any questions, if there's anything that I don't touch upon, or if there's just anything that you'd like me to sort of weigh in on as best as I can, I do welcome you to ask your questions in the comments below, and I will try to address those as quickly and efficiently as I can and as thoroughly as I can. Before I go on, by the way, I would like to just express that, you know, this isn't the only time of year that we should be doing spirit work. This is a great time for it. If this is an easier time to do spirit work because that veil is thinner, it just makes sense to take advantage of that and to fortify bonds that throughout the year will benefit us. So at this time of year, when many of us consider seasonal spirit work, I think what comes to mind most readily is ancestor work. But there is, I feel, a lot more that we can do in terms of seasonal spirit work. There are some options available. You know, if we open our minds, it's not only about ancestor veneration at this time of year. While it's good it's wonderful to utilize the thinning of the veil to facilitate a stronger and deeper bond with those who have gone before that are related to us in particular. I do feel also that this would be an excellent time to open up to and seek greater connection with guardians and guides that we may have that are not necessarily related to us or that may never have lived an earthly life. It makes sense to fortify bonds between ourselves and our guardians and guides because they are the ones who are looking out for us in this life. You know, they're sort of like our spiritual compass. It's, it's rather important to, I feel, have a really clear and strong connection with them, particularly if we tend to call upon them, for example, when we do divinations or just when we have uncertain times in our lives in general. This would be a great time of year to reach out to deceased people who maybe we never met in life because maybe they lived at a time before we were ever alive, you know. Um, maybe they were never related to us, maybe we never knew them, but they inspire us, they motivate us. Also, this doesn't have to be only a time to work with human spirits. We can work with spirits of departed pets, familiars or fur babies, whichever you consider them to be. You know, we all have different, um, I guess you could say, sort of views of or bonds with the special little critters in our lives, you know, however we tend to look at them really doesn't matter as much. What matters as much, what matters more, I should say, is that we love them. They were part of our lives. We were blessed to have them. And while some people may not realize it, even in their little quiet way, they have lessons and things to teach us as well. Also, this would be an excellent time of year for work with general animal spirits. In seeking to process and integrate their wisdom and lessons so that we may better ourselves as people. For example, um, Maybe you might choose to work with the spirit of the hummingbird at this time of year, you know, to sort out some emotional issues in your life. 
some issues that may deal with your, your relationships or with your self-love or self-esteem or whatever. It doesn't have to be the hummingbird bell. I'm just using that as an example. These are some options, you know, but honestly, the possibilities here, they're endless. You know, as far as you can open your mind, that's, that's as far as the possibilities go. So do be open to the truth that, you know, seasonal spirit work doesn't have to be limited to, you know, people. It doesn't have to be limited to ancestors. It doesn't have to be limited to just the concept of death or, or deceased people in general. It doesn't have to be about that. Let's say you want to work with angels. Let's say you want to work with demons. Let's say you want to work with whatever you want to, whatever spiritual entities you want to work with. You know, you can work with powers that maybe are not deified, but still they are powers nonetheless. You know, you may want to work with something like, you know, the spirit of Jack of the Lantern, or, you know, maybe you want to work with the spirit of like La Llorona to process you know, lessons that have to do with maybe seeking too much from relationships or sacrificing the wrong things for the wrong reasons, you know, or giving too much of yourself or, you know, something else that's related to her lore. We can utilize meditation, we can utilize prayer, which, by the way, uh, this would be a great time of year to make prayer cards. I made this little one for Santa Muerte, and I have her picture on the front, and I printed out a picture on the back. What I did is, in Photoshop, I put the two images together, like a greeting card, or like a, the cover of a book, the front and back cover. You know, I just printed them together, and I folded them in half once I printed the image and the prayer. And then I cut them out, and then I used packing tape. I made it small. I used packing tape to laminate it. You can kind of see I laminated it real nice. Other methods by which we might connect with, bond with, and work with certain spirits at this time of year. Um, maybe you can work on learning how to lucid dream, and then you can invite certain spirits to meet with you on the astral plane. You could make offering. You don't have to have an altar in order to make offering. It's just, in itself, it is something good to do. You know, if you feed the spirits, they will be stronger and they will be able to work with you and things will just kind of flow better. You know, you, stronger spirits equals stronger communication avenues and it's just respectful, you know. If you're expecting them to come into your life and guide you and teach you things, you know, maybe you should give something in return. Also, the use of crystals can help to strengthen the avenue of communication between yourself and the spirits you intend to be working with. Particularly, you know, in terms of like quartz crystals. Quartz are great amplifiers. Also, we can do candle work to call upon and connect with certain spirits at this time of year. Now, at this point in the video, because ancestor work happens to be something that a lot of people have questions about and tend to do more this year, or this year, this time of year I should say. I'm going to transition into an edited version of a video that I did for Witches of the Moon. It's a video where I discuss aspects of ancestor veneration, but I think it's important that I discuss this here because I just think that it it really does lend to the conversation that we're having today. And again, if you have any questions or anything regarding it, feel free to put those down below. Do keep in mind the things that I speak about in respect to ancestor altars also apply to other sorts of spiritual altars if you're going to be working with other spiritual powers at this time of year. 
Many people from many cultures, and not just today, but stretching back into history, have acknowledged the wisdom of their elders, their forefathers, and their foremothers. Many cultures see the spirits of departed kin as spiritual allies, guardians, and guides to their living descendants. Many people believe that ancestors care about and look out for their descendants because family love is something that transcends the boundary between life and death. I also want to touch upon the the one thing that a lot of people will bring up when when we talk about ancestor veneration or ancestor work. There are people who say, what do I do? I was adopted. I don't know who my family is. Love can be more powerful a bond than physical blood. You don't have to have a blood bond. You were adopted into a family. You were taken into a tribe, so to speak. So you can work with the ancestors of your adoptive family, but you can also work with your own ancestors, even though you don't know who they are. Now you will notice today I have here a skull that is symbolic and meaningful. This normally sits on my ancestor altar. This represents any and all of my ancestors who I don't know who they are. This is a symbol for those who have gone before who I have no idea who they are, but they're still there and I still acknowledge them. So if you, let's say, were adopted and you don't know who your people are, if you feel a call in your soul to work with them, you can do what I have done. Use something. Some people use stones. Or you can use like a little carved skull like this. Something you can use. Anything you choose that you feel captures the idea of your ancestry. Use whatever resonates with you that you feel really does symbolize to you the idea of those spirits. They're there. They will be there for you, even if you don't know who they are. And if you are, let's say, trying to open up a dialogue with them, you're trying to pray to them, but you don't know what to say, what to call them, because you don't know who they are, you can say something like, mothers of my mothers and fathers of my fathers. Or you can say, you know, I pray to my ancestors. Or you can just say, dear ancestors, and you can start talking to them. You know, you can use any terminology you feel, but you don't have to have a specific name to call on. They will know that you're calling. They will know, okay? Now, there's various ways you can work with your ancestors. You can set up an ancestor altar, which is something that many, many people do. It's not the only way to work with your ancestors, but a lot of people feel that it's a very appropriate thing to do, and they will regularly refresh the altar. There's a lot of different views that go into how to keep and refresh an altar. None are particularly right or wrong. It's not like there's one recipe, but different people will have differing opinions on this. I personally believe that um, there is an importance to, to having a dialogue with your ancestors. You can pray to your ancestors. You can just talk to them. Just tell them how you feel. You don't have to approach them asking for things. I think it helps when you're, when you're working with ancestors, if you remember, like, th this is your family. These are your people. Treat them as such, okay? It shouldn't be a tit-for-tat relationship. It shouldn't be like, oh, well, if you give them this, you get that. It's not how it works. You should always be conscious of and loving toward and reverent to your ancestors. And they will always naturally look out for you. Now they have been looking out for you before any kind of work that you might do. You know, they, they, that's just what they do. They look out for you. They don't need veneration per se, but what veneration does is empowers them to be able to help you and be there for you and be there with you. And why wouldn't you want your family being with you through life, helping you, guiding you, giving you counsel? steering you right. Of course you would want that. Some people will say, be careful, there are sometimes spirits that will masquerade as your ancestors, and for a while they'll try to fool you.
But how you will know when it's really your ancestors is that your life is going to start to get better and it's going to stay better. Problems that you had will begin to resolve. You know, um, obstacles that were in your way will begin to dissolve. Connections will begin to be made. You know, opportunities will open up. They will help you. They will be on your side. They will empower you as you empower them with love and honor. Let's say um, you're receiving messages that you think might be coming from your ancestors. Pay attention to what is being said because you know what? If it's really your ancestors, they won't tell you to harm people. They won't tell you to do things that can land you in jail or get you in trouble. You know, or they won't be asking you for things that may not be safe to do or give. If you find that you're not sure, all of a sudden, bam, you're getting these intense messages and it's like you just started this work. Go with your gut instinct. Go with that deeper sense within yourself. It will guide you right. If you feel like something's kind of off, keep venerating your ancestors. Keep honoring your ancestors. And then finally, when your life begins to really improve, then you're going to see that you really made the connection. You finally made the connection. For those of you who might have been wondering, um, this figure here, this is a representation that I keep on my ancestor altar. She is the avo l'umil uvo, that is the grandmother of my grandfather, okay? In Portugal, she was like a spiritualist. She would help many, many people. And I never met her. I don't have any photos of her. So a while ago, what I did is I made this doll. I sculpted her out of clay. And she represents the spirit of my grandfather's grandmother. Her, her whole aim was like to help people when they had problems. And it wasn't even like, oh, well, you have to pay or you don't get help. She would do things in exchange sometimes for favors or like, hey, you know, people would bring her like a chicken or maybe they would like, you know, bring her food they cooked or maybe they'd say, oh, you know, I'm going to come and tend your garden for you, you know, if, if she helped them out. You know, it would be like she would accept barter because some people didn't have money. That's just what she did. It wasn't about getting rich, you know, and I have a lot of respect for that because there's integrity in that. Okay, so now that you've seen that video, that edited version of my Ancestor Veneration video that I did for Witches of the Moon, I think now it's time for our question of the day. This question of the day also regards ancestor work. And it is something that I have heard people debate. The question of the day is, do you believe that it's okay to place ancestor altars in the bedroom? Or do you feel that the bedroom is not an appropriate place for ancestor altars? Because oftentimes the bedroom is a place where intimate things happen and perhaps you don't feel that it's appropriate for those intimate things to take place in front of your ancestors. I'd like to hear what your opinion is. There are no wrong answers. I'm asking this because I feel that this can spark some interesting discussion below in the comments. Um, as for our writing exercise of the day, for our Samhain journals, I'm going to invite you to write your thoughts about spirit work at this time of year in your style and journal. If you also choose, you may wish to, or alternately, if you don't want to so much go into your general thoughts about spirit work, you may alternately wish to compose some prayers to whatever power or powers you may be working with at this time of year. Whether, again, whether it be ancestors, whether it be guardians and guides, whether it be, you know, familiar spirits or what have you, I do invite you to compose some prayers, some of your own prayers. So, yeah, I guess that's going to be our video for today. 
I hope that you have enjoyed it. I hope you've been enjoying my 13 Days of Samhain series thus far overall. And I will see you tomorrow with episode 4 of the 13 Days of Samhain. So, blessed be Anashe, and you have a great day. Till tomorrow, you stay awesome, and bye-bye for now.